thanks very much for the invitation to, to be here. It's really fantastic to be back in Ireland. I remember when I was uh, political director, uh, coming to Ireland and having uh, the bilateral uh, discussions with, it was then uh, Rory Montgomery, my counterpart, was extremely easy. He was just ticking all the boxes uh, of uh, agreements between uh, Sweden and, and Ireland. Um, and I also uh, I remember another occasion when I was here when, with my wife and we were totally lost in the uh, countryside and, uh, and instead of, uh, we actually were unable to find a place to, to stay and uh, we ended up having uh, dinner instead. Um, and, uh, and everyone in that restaurant was just so engaged in our, in our uh, conundrum about finding a, a room. <laughs> and in the end, uh, we were all invited to drinks and all the Catrionas and Fionas and Angus's in that restaurant then helped us to you know, call a friend who knew a friend. And in the end, of course, they found us a room somewhere. And I, I just want to say that had that been in Sweden, we would have spent that evening or night in the car. <laughs> um, so it's always uh, a, a fantastic to be bad. Uh, can I hear the crowd is already <laughs> support. Um, I know that you've had some very prominent uh, representatives of, uh, from Brussels here previously, including, of course, the foremost uh, David O'Sullivan and also um, uh, the EDA, Claude Fonsanou, and the chairman of the military committee, etc. Um, so I'll, I'll limit myself to talk about really what we do in the PSC, and I'll say a little bit about the, that political and security committee. Um, and, uh, and the Lisbon novelty about the work uh, uh, in, in Brussels on uh, the foreign policy side. Um, I'll say a few words about uh, perhaps if there are a, a few achievements, but also then end by, by talking about um, uh, the, the challenges, because uh, there are certainly a lot of challenges uh, uh, left to be dealt with. Um, um, the, the role of the PEC is, is about um, monitoring the international situation um, and then to try to uh, suggest or recommend a policy response uh, to that. Um, and, uh, and much of that is about preparing the decisions that the Foreign Affairs Council uh, uh, are, are taking. I mean, the foreign ministers come traveling about once a, once a month and, and to, maybe this is revealing a secret, but it's certainly not so that they would sit down on Monday morning and negotiate uh, those decisions. They're, they're well prepared, most of them, in advance. And the PEC has a fairly central role in doing that. Um, uh, we also um, prepare, actually, the, the, uh, the councils of ministers of defense, because we have an additional role which comes to the uh, common uh, security and defense policy. Um, and we do conduct um, uh, you know, political guidance and, and strategic advice to all our missions and operations. And that's, of course, thousands of men and women out in various operations and missions under the EU uh, hat in various places in the world. And, that, and so there, too, the PEC has a fairly central role. Um, 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 and, and I think, and, and then. You know, I just reread a little bit what the task, I forget sometimes, so we're actually also tasked to implement and to make sure that the policies we agree on are actually then implemented. I think that perhaps one of the tasks that we haven't really uh, had time to, pen, to pay as much attention to as perhaps we should have. Now, um, uh, the, the, the novelty, uh, well, I, I'm, as, as you said, I'm, I'm the permanent uh, chair. Um, I'm not even a chairman. I don't know why they choose the word chair instead of chairman. But in French, it's président, and I think that sounds a lot better than, than, than the chair. Because it's true that, of course, a chair is some, something that uh, people will usually sit on. Uh, and making that uh, permanent is, is, is adding uh, insult to injury. But, but um, what, it, what it is, is, is actually, I mean, the power I have is about setting the agenda. And that in itself is, is, is not... Is not it's not pointless, um, um, but I mean, let's let's remember that we will not get anywhere in the EU common foreign security policy unless everyone is agreed, and the Lisbon Treaty hasn't really changed that. It's it's all about uh, getting 27 member states uh, to agree. 27 member states, all of which have has a, a veto, if you like. Um, and, um, and as I, I, I think some of the examples will, will show, uh, that, that has been quite a challenge, uh, actually, to, to actually come up with anything during uh, some of the issues uh, surrounding the Arab Spring. Um, the, um, uh, we, we, uh,
The, the other um, aspect to, to this is when we set up the External Action Service, uh, we, of course, took over from the rotating presidency the chairing of the PEC, but also other geographical working groups in, in Brussels. Uh, and that, uh, um, uh, and at the same time, the External Action Service was, because we, we, it was set up in a way, at least initially, making use of the resources that existed already, particularly in the Commission. And much of the staff that make up the External Action Service is therefore from the Commission. Um, with all the talents that they have uh, and continuity in working, but usually fairly uh, long-term kind of work with, uh, with the uh, rest of the world. Um, the challenge that I see very strongly that we still have is about the part that we've, the hat we've taken over, which is about the rotating presidency, the six months presidency that in the past was a driving force of initiative, of energy, um, to put in and, uh, uh, into the into the European uh, Union foreign policy, um, uh, and and the staff to do that. A presidency. I was part as as the as the chair said. I was part of the uh, of the Swedish uh, uh, presidency in two thousand nine. And of course, that was planned. You know, we started two years before planning the initiatives, the the issues we would be doing. We had, actually, we had uh, you know. A, a, Books uh, and 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 um, you know folders about every uh, possible conflict that could erupt during that the, those six months. And of course, the first thing that happened, by the way, was a coup d'état in Honduras, which was not part of what we had actually <laughs> foreseen. And, and the first months were spent uh, dealing with Honduras, where we had no embassy and very little knowledge. Uh, but anyway, uh, I mean. That, that we, we can't, we don't have the luxury now to do that kind of forward planning because we're running it um, and, uh, and, uh, and but we're also uh, charged with the responsibility of putting energy and leadership into this project. And I think that is a challenge and I think therefore that it's quite urgent also that the foreign, uh, minister, the foreign, foreign ministries are able to put forward the best and the brightest and provide uh, diplomat input into the external action service as it is being set up and of course the aim is to have one third um, diplomatic um, uh, participation and contribution to this um, uh, new uh, system uh, in 2013. Uh, there are budgetary uh, concerns here though because it, it, um, it, 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 it's, it's costly. Um, anyway, so those are those are some of the some of the challenges that we're confronted with. The, the advantage of the PC, the, the 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 added value it has, is really about you know you have 27 ambassadors uh, present in Brussels who can meet basically whenever there is a crisis going on. So there's a sort of a very quick reaction to uh, the possibility of setting an item on the agenda can be done very quickly. We met on Sundays and Saturdays, and we meet, uh, but the normal uh, tempo is is uh, is twice a week. Uh, we have not been able to, to keep that because it's usually, I think, has the average is probably around three times a week. Um, um, so there's this presence of high-level representatives of all 27 member states readily available in, in Brussels, and that has a, a speed to it, which is quite good. Um, if with the challenge about you know taking the initiative and the leadership, etc., um, <coughs> is is one very very real. There is also something to be said about continuity, and I think that was the idea about the Lisbon Treaty, to do away with the rotating presidency, one that, you know, that puts forward an, uh, sometimes a national agenda, etc., uh, in favor of, of something more continuous. And I think that you know, uh, it's, it's tough to, to, to be a permanent chair, but I think it has an advantage also to the third countries, to the outside world, who interact with us. They know who we are, they know where we are. Um, and um, uh, and people, you know, eventually also the member states will get used to to this uh, this uh, new system and the continuity itself. I think has has a lot of um, potential in it. Uh, what the PSC is also able to do, and we've done that quite a bit already, is to uh, draw from you know we have the the network of EU delegations around the world. This is new because the rotating presidency could not draw upon them. Um, they're there at our service. Of course, this is also a system which is still being built up to the, to the full extent, but it's actually quite useful to us. We ver very often are able to bring a head of delegation into the PSC to be there and to brief us about the real situation on the ground. Only last week we had the head of delegation from Iraq uh, there, uh, Pakistan uh, the week before that, etc. So this is an added value. Uh, but not only that, because we can also 
put to member states, if we have a development such as in Belarus, for instance, you remember there was a great turmoil surrounding the 19th December elections last year and the demonstrations that entail and the crackdown and repressive way of dealing with that from the regime. Um, very quickly, we, we were able to, and I think that was not possible in the past, to put forward to member states, you know, very quickly an options paper. This, this, these are the EU instruments that we could, that we could consider uh, putting into play. Sanctions, but also a lot of commission instruments that are there and could be channeled to support the, the opposition, uh, you know, um, some cooperation with, with uh, um, uh, agents of change, whatever else. And so I think we're able, if this works, and sometimes it, it will still you know, need to be uh, improved, but we have the possibility of actually putting all the EU instruments and put them forward to member states to agree on. And that's certainly an advantage. Um, um, I think we've also been able to, uh, during uh, some of the situations we've had in the, in the, um, in the uh, southern neighborhood in the Arab Spring, where there's been concerns about consular, you know, EU uh, citizens uh, in Egypt uh, during uh, the demonstrations or, or uh, in Tunisia, or Cote d'Ivoire, etc. Um, the PEC is, is um, you know, there's a system of a consular network by telephone, etc. But the PEC is really able to very quickly, as I said, to meet and to get the, the latest uh, briefing. Member states can share their information about <coughs> uh, the information they would have about where their uh, citizens are and what kind of uh, resources they would have to make available if there's a ship leaving from you know, the, the uh, Libyan port, um, uh, there, there and then there's a possibility to sort of feed that information immediately back to member states and they could put their citizens on that ship. So this has also has become, it's very broad actually, it's, it's this broadening of the, what, what, what we would no, normally be doing simply because we're, we're there and we're available and it's a useful tool to the, to the high representative. Um, we also uh, very frequently invite uh, foreign uh, foreign guests. Um, um, we've had um, uh, foreign ministers of uh, you know Sahel of uh, African Union representatives. We usually very often on a regular basis meet with uh, high representatives from the um, United Nations, from the OSCE Secretary General. Um, uh, um, uh, as an example, U.S. envoys uh, come in uh, and we invite them in because they also. Um, uh, and I'll come to that later, I think the EU will, will need to coordinate much of our policies more than we've done in the past with, with partners, be that the, particularly the US, but certainly Turkey and, and many others. Um, and, and therefore, it's useful to have those kinds of dialogues. And I think that, um, a, you know, a, a, a Dick Holbrook or someone that um, was a bad example, given that he's passed away, but it, but it was just an example of someone who came into the PC, coming to Brussels, the PEC is there, you, you can, with one hour conversation with us, you immediately, in that hour, you reach 27 member states capitals with, with, in one go. And you get a feel, they get a feel for where the EU and member states um, are on, on, on a topical issue, in this case, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So those are the good things. But let me say, too, that obviously, uh, running a shop like this with 27 member states who all have a veto is also a, a very cumbersome process. Um, and uh, you sometimes, on a bad day, you of course think, you know, what are we doing? Uh, spending so much time negotiating uh, commas in, in texts that are perhaps not always read <laughs> by everyone we would wish um, would read it. Um, you know, I, I, one can understand that when other parts of the EU system deals with real national security related issues uh, on nuclear energy or whatever else that you know everyone was really pushed for their positions but it, when it's about interacting uh, forming a common policy vis-a-vis -vis an event going on somewhere else Burma or Zimbabwe or or, or uh, you know closer to home than that but still outside the European Union you would think that given that we are a club of, of values that everyone has joined up to, that we would sometimes be able to re respond more uh, quicker and that people would more uh, easily let go of some of their hang-ups uh, for the sake of the common good. Having said that, I, I still, you know, on a good day, I would also be quite impressed by the fact that 27 vetoes are so easily um, put aside 
And, uh, and especially in the PEC, I would say, we, there is a community of, of ambassadors empowered by their foreign ministers. Most of them have a direct access to their foreign ministers to um, uh, agree. Um, and there's a sense of prestige that you know you, you you don't necessarily feel good even if you brilliantly put forward uh, your instruction and blocked everyone else. I mean, you could say that that's a good thing in a multilateral organization, perhaps. But in the EU, most people will do a lot in order to communicate back to their capital that this doesn't really fly. Um, you know, we have 25 or 26 others colleagues who are against us. And the advice of most of my colleagues will then be for, for, them, for them to step down or, or to, um, uh, to uh, alter their positions in order to find common ground. And I think uh, most days I'm quite impressed by the fact that this works fairly well. Um, and I'll give a few examples of where it, where it has worked actually surprisingly, surprisingly good. There are still things, you know, uh, the EAS is still, uh, our relationship with the Commission is not always as good as it would be, um, as it should be, as member states should expect it to be. Um, uh, I think you, as representatives of, uh, of member states, should be very watchful about how the resources are used in Brussels so that we avoid duplication among what the Commission is doing, about what the EAS is doing. I think you should demand that the delegations that you are that we are setting up as EU embassies, if you like, that they really deliver uh, to all member states, sharing of reports, etc. Some of that reporting is actually getting to be quite good. Um, uh, so, so I still think there is, a, as always, a need to be watchful about how EU bureaucrats um, get ahead of themselves. Um, uh, but, but. But having said that, um, uh, again, the PC remains a, a very important body for interaction between member states uh, and, and the external action service and the common foreign policy. I sometimes feel myself a little bit as a sort of a rubber duck at the head of the shooting gallery. Uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, when member states are, are unhappy about a uh, you know, statement made in Damascus or that we've done this or that or not done this or that and why was Cathy Ashen in, in, in Beijing instead of Benghazi or why was she in Benghazi instead of Beijing, etc. <laughs> Some of that, of course, comes, to, comes through the PSC to me and that, that's, that can be quite tiresome sometimes. But on the other hand, I, I also see my role within the External Action Service, as I said, very much as an advocate as, a, uh, as taking a bit the temperature of where member states are in terms of how we are doing. Um, looking back at, at the first, uh, I guess it's 10 months now since I took on this job and since we introduced the system of a permanent chair, um, uh, the whole Arab Spring, uh, um, I think, I mean, apart from that being a very fundamentally very positive thing happening in, in uh, authoritarian uh, countries. It's also been quite good institutionally looking because I, I was among those who were quite frustrated about how institutional discussions in Brussels takes a lot of energy away from the things that we should be doing, especially on the foreign policy side. Um, and starting this year with everything that has happened, we simply have not had time to, to dwell too much about you know grievances we might have with the Commission or that they might have with us, because it's, we really have had to respond very quickly to things that have gone on. Uh, and, and you can criticize us, and people do, about not having responded quickly enough or, or you know, but, but in the end, I think, from where I sit, I think we've done fairly good uh, in responding to the Arab Spring mostly. The EU has, has been way ahead of, um, of the UN, for instance, when it comes to uh, punishing uh, the uh, or former regimes, uh, in imposing sanctions on, on the Mubaraks and the Ben Ali's, um, uh, and, and, uh, and taking a lead on that. We've been quite instrumental, I think, in keeping up a, a multilateral framework in, uh, on the uh, Libya situation through these Cairo group uh, efforts, EU, UN, African Union, League of Arab States, etc., always to not, you know, to avoid unilateralism and to keep uh, a steady um, uh, international pressure and support, although that has not always been easy, especially not with the African Union when it comes to the Libya situation, but we've certainly made that effort. Um, um, and, and, and I must say that coming in on, on both on Tunisia and on Egypt early on, 
you, you will understand and appreciate that member states, if you look at the whole range of, of, of the union, um, come into a, a discussion uh, from very different uh, viewpoints. Some have uh, uh, you know, long-standing uh, economic relations with a certain regime and are keen not to, uh, you know, to distract from stability, etc., uh, and to um, make sure that those, um, uh, you know, that we s stick to what we have and stability per perhaps is sort of a catchword when we start these discussions for some. For others, it's very much about uh, human rights, democracy, and, and promoting change and, and transition, etc. And to square that discussion into a common view has not always been easy, but given those starting points, it, I don't think we've done all that bad. Uh, people will say that on Libya, um, it was a bad moment for the EU CSTP, that we did not take on what NATO did eventually uh, to uh, militarily uh, observe the and, and re enforce the uh, arms embargo, etc. Uh, I think I, I, I would beg to differ. I think it's um, the division of labor that emerged is probably, was probably the best one, and I would say that for now, where we are now, the EU stands fairly well uh, in both credibility and, uh, and in a position with our various instruments to do uh, play a major role in the um, work that needs to be done, not just in Libya, but also in, in other parts of the Arab world. Um, there are other issues much closer to, um, uh, or also in our neighborhood, which are, are, are very, uh, which we've dealt with uh, with various degree of, uh, of uh, success, but we've certainly uh, done our share. I think I mentioned Belarus, I'll come back to it, but I think there we were able to actually uh, put together a set of, um, of uh, instruments, both uh, um, carrot and stick, if you like, and supporting the opposition and the dissidents, which is uh, quite useful. We have been uh, uh, working up this whole communication about more for more. I think the whole experience from the Arab Spring is that uh, the EU uh, should uh, be much more careful about not supporting um, uh, authoritarian regimes and that the ones that are uh, submitting to and adhering to our values should be rewarded and the other ones should not. Uh, that's, a, that's a novelty um, and that's a very important conclusion and that's been sort of always um, uh, hammered out through consensus, uh, not least in the PSC. Um, uh, on the Western Balkans, um, there has been some very interesting, I think, mediation efforts done that have not been so publicly known. Um, uh, in Albania, for instance, uh, in the course of the elections in spring, uh, a lot of turmoil, uh, deaths, uh, etc. And the EU, uh, we were able to immediately send out a mediator um, who could, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, first come to the PC in the morning, get an endorsement from the messages that he would send to the parties that were on the different sides in the Albanian political context and travel to Tirana and convey then the very strong messages based on, on, on a, a sounding out of where uh, not just the EAS but where the 27 member states are and the expectations that we would have on, on the various Albanian parties. And this also I think is fairly new and has been quite successful in, the, in, in this case. The Bosnian case is another one where Cathy Ashton could travel to, the, uh, to, uh, to Bosnia and to convey again a message based on very much sounding out in the PSC about where member states are in, in terms of expectations. And for countries whose um, uh, overriding goal is to uh, accede uh, eventually to the European Union, those kind of messages, messages can actually uh, have an impact. Um, on, the, on the Belgrade, uh, Pristina, this is a very tricky issue. The whole Kosovo issue remains very tricky. You know uh, that there are five member states who have not recognized Kosovo, and of course this adds to uh, the complication in a way. On the other hand, I wanted to say that um, in spite of that, there is a very strong EU commitment to this dialogue that the EU is running between Kosovo and Belgrade, which is really the only show in town when it comes to actually building confidence between these two. Um, and, uh, and in combination with the holding out of the EU perspective, both, both Belgrade and Pristina, this, this is potentially uh, very important. That effort was tried in New York for a while with the EU there. It didn't work. Um, and I'd like to say here that the PEC again proved its worth because uh, bringing difficult issues that do not... Um, uh, necessarily work elsewhere into the PC in Brussels have helped. 
in New York, you will have obviously, um, you know, you, you have member states uh, who are permanent members of the Security Council. For them, uh, the EU choice, the EU common position is not the, always the first choice, not in New York anyway. Um, but if you bring an issue to Brussels, the inclination of coming to a common ground is much stronger, also among, uh, in this case, UK and France. Um, and, and this is a case in point where we're actually able to seal a deal in, among ourselves on the belgrade pristina dialogue with Belgrade uh, in Brussels that, that was not able to be sealed in New York. Now, um, Middle East peace process, um, I mean, I realize that some of the things I list as, as, as successful examples are far from resolved, but I'm talking more about the fact that I think we've done our part in trying to come up with a common EU response to it. Middle East peace process is the final example I wanted to take, and that's, of course, a situation that continues to be extremely difficult. Um, but I don't think that the EU has ever had such an important political role as it does now in the quartet. And it, of course, has to do with the fact that the US has backed down slightly. Um, um, uh, but it's based on, uh, and you will probably wonder about the EU unity, given that there was a vote in UNESCO where everyone was all over the place. But um, let's not forget that the EU has uh, some very strong and clear um, positions on the Middle East peace process that have been formulated um, time and again in the last two years in various council conclusions. And that stays, and that remains our position. And that has not been entirely easily, easy, because that there too, member states come in from fairly different uh, starting points. But I just wanted to say that, and, and this is something that the PC has been quite instrumental in, there's this very few weeks go by without a deliberation on the Middle East peace process and a very strong effort to keep the EU united. And that's not just an issue that, that concerns the EU. Actually, the Palestinians are very keen that the EU keep together. Um, they, want an, uh, the, the Western, or they want Europe to be, uh, to be united. And they also know that when Europe is united, and the EU has a, a common line. There are very many other important players, uh, Switzerland, uh, Norway, um, uh, and others uh, who usually joins up to those positions. Now, is everything hunky-dory? Far from it. Um, I would, um, before opening the, the session on questions and answers, I, I would um, like to just say that I think we should be concerned about the fact that, um, you know, the European mood is one of um, inward-looking, um, debt crisis, uh, a lot of political energy is spent on trying to get our uh, economic act together, and rightly so, given where we are. But of course the concern is that this will take away energy from the foreign policy side. Um, I, I, I say that because I work with that side of the house, but also I think uh, there are many out there, outside the European Union, who have expectations for the EU to continue to play a, an important and proactive role in the global, the global scene. I think we have to ask ourselves, do we have the energy to come back and, and, and really play a credible uh, global role, given where we are on the inward-looking discussion that is going on now? Um, the European relative weight is is not increasing, it's the other way around. There are new players, uh, uh, Brazil, India, Russia, China, etc. The same discussion, by the way, that we're having here about how others are, are more important now is taking place in the US. They feel the same way as we do. Um, what does that mean to us? Well, um, I think we have to, we have to analyze that. Our, 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 our populations are not growing, our economies are not growing the way that others are, and we just need to uh, uh, relate to that. I think there's another concern, and that is about the one of our main assets have been the attraction of the European Union as a union. And this has been very powerful in creating and promoting reform in our neighborhood, especially in the Western Balkans, but also in Eastern Europe. Where is that today? Uh, does the European Union continue to be an attractive um, uh, union to join? I think the economic uh, grievances we're going through have an impact on this, but I also think that, unfortunately, the political momentum and the political signals that we're sending out has uh, perhaps not been as clear about what is there in the end of the tunnel for some countries, Turkey being perhaps the best example. I think we should be concerned about that. Um, the other thing is 
about um, resources in general and what they mean, uh, not just in the faith and the energy that we need, but also in terms of actually putting men and women on the ground. Military uh, expenditure will go down. It's actually very high in, 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 in Europe. Um, um, and we have a lot of uh, people in uniform. Uh, if we add up, I think there's about 1.7 million. But there are very few of them who are actually deployable internationally. <coughs> Uh, I think that um, uh, should um, that in combination with the fact that uh, the U.S. is not as committed to European security in terms of keeping um, their forces here. We, I think there's lessons to be learned about the Libya operation, where the EU, EU European countries took the lead. The U.S. for one of the first times actually put themselves on the back burner, but. I think everyone who has been involved in this, I haven't, but I hear, I hear from those who were, that that operation would not, was no way would have been carried out without some key capabilities that the US have contributed. What does this mean when the US is cutting down their expenditures for, for, for defense? Um, and so are we. I think uh, we need to do uh, and look very seriously at this pooling and sharing of our resources that we must come together much more um, to, to, um, to see how we spend our money in defense. And it makes sense, I would argue, to do that more jointly. It doesn't have to be the European Union necessarily, but the European Union through the uh, European Defense Agency actually do contribute with a certain amount of uh, an umbrella to make sure that we spend our, our money uh, wisely in all the things that will be necessary in the future. Um, why do we have 27 uh, military headquarters uh, or, or military staffs in a, in a Europe which is not, uh, I don't think anyone would argue that we are threatening each other, but we certainly need to do more together. I don't want to put f too much focus on the military side of this, but I think the EU is actually quite well suited to deal with some of the new security threats if we're able to put together uh, the civilian things we're doing, civilian experts, uh, much of the cooperation aid, uh, etc., that lies within the Commission and member states. If we're able to do more of this in a comprehensive way, as we're trying to do now in the Horn of Africa, for instance, I think that's a little bit where the future will lie. But it will cost, uh, and we'll, I, I hope that there's still a readiness to provide resources. The same thing about civilian resources. If we argue that, this, that uh, that's one of the EU's niches, is about uh, providing military, uh, sorry, uh, police, judges, etc. Well, the fact is we have, we have difficulties in recruiting that type of personnel to our missions. Um, uh, of course, uh, many of these are needed in their respective countries, but it's also a question of costs. Um, so having said all this, I, I just think there are, uh, I would argue that the uh, recipe for dealing with some of these challenges is more cooperation, not less, among ourselves in the European Union. It's also about reaching out and working more uh, and better and more effectively with strategic partners, be they the US, um, uh, Turkey, um, and others, uh, Brazil, India. Um, um, uh, and, uh, and even if we were able to do that, um, uh, you know, there would still be a lot of uh, issues, still uh, one damn thing after the other to deal with, where the PSC will continue to have a role. I think the Middle East peace process is something that we really need to get to terms with because it, it adds a very poisonous um, tone to a lot of the, the grievances that are going on in the Middle East, and I think there's more urgency to this than has been in the past. Iran, let's not forget, that sort of hovers around all this. Uh, in a very scary way. Um, so there is, uh, and I also think that the Arab Spring, we need to, uh, uh, first of all, be clear about that we are not running this. We can only come in as support to a limited effect of this, but it's very important that that turns out good. And I think Egypt is one of the cases that needs to be watched in the, in the near term. Um, I'll just um, stop there and um, be glad to... Um, for the camera to be turned off um, and to go to the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Yeah.